am excited to introduce tonight's first speaker, Dr. Steve Davis. Thank you, Zach. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you all this evening and talk about how sending water south uh, really benefits all areas of the Everglades. Um, and so when we talk about sending water south, it's taking water from Lake Okeechobee, really, that used to flow to the south historically, all the way here that this image shows to the edge of Florida Bay. And so this image uh, I really like because it shows water flowing across that finish line into Florida Bay, its, its final destination. And you can see that the tea stained color of that water because that fresh water has passed through a pretty extensive mangrove forest before reaching um, Florida Bay. Now, sending water south to the Everglades uh, is, is really, again, mimicking what that historic system did. And we know that today, that water that hits Lake Okeechobee is discharged to the east and the west coast, um, down the St. Lucie River, down the Caloosahatchee River on the west coast. Uh, that water's polluted. Uh, and that's what that orange color on the left is intended to illustrate. And so as we send water south, we need to make sure that that water is clean to the best of our ability. And obviously, uh, coming from a polluted water like uh, water body like Lake Okeechobee, that, that can't be accomplished to the extent that those discharges can be at times. So clean water uh, is, a, is a fundamental part of Everglades restoration. And the reason why it's part of Everglades restoration is because of the sensitivity of these environments to phosphorus pollution. And the images that I'm showing you here, these are illustrations showing what a natural Everglades habitat looks like where you have deeper uh, sloughs that are vegetated with floating aquatic plants like water lilies, submerged aquatic plants. There's paraphyton mats that are uh, uh, healthy algae that really represent the base of the food web in the Everglades. And then sawgrass ridges and, and places for uh, wading birds and alligators to, to, to forage. Now, when we pollute these ecosystems with phosphorus over a long period of time, we see a transformation of the habitat from this uh, healthy ridge and slough habitat to nothing but cattail. And, and obviously the, the food web itself changes as a result of that. And this is not unlike the sensitivity of our estuaries and, and coastal waters to chronic pollution of nitrogen and phosphorus. And, and certainly uh, those in Martin County are, are quite familiar with the toxic blue-green algae associated with those discharges. Um, and, and, and certainly on the West Coast and, and occasionally on the East Coast, we'll see red tide uh, work its way around uh, the, the Florida Straits. And so these, sens these, these sensitive habitats need to be protected. And the way we do that through Everglades restoration uh, by sending water south, uh, we reduce those polluted discharges to the east and the west, but we also take advantage of the functional capacity of wetlands to clean that water uh, before it flows to the Everglades. And so the state has uh, constructed nearly 70,000 acres of treatment marshes in the southern area of the Everglades agricultural area. Um, these are mostly stormwater treatment areas, but some are called flow equalization basins illustrated on this map. Uh, I've included an image here to show what these systems look like. These are, again, engineered wetlands that are managed to treat that polluted water so that it, as it flows out the other end, it's substantially cleaner uh, than it was when it, when it flowed in. Now, one of the key projects that is part of Everglades restoration is the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir, highlighted in red here. Now, this reservoir will allow us to take a much larger quantity of water and flow it south to the Everglades. And again, think the more water that goes south, the less discharges are going east and west. And you'll see that this project also has a stormwater treatment associated with it, so that as we're moving water, again, polluted from Lake Okeechobee and from some of that runoff from the agricultural area itself, that water can be treated uh, before it goes to the Everglades. 
Now, as we flow more water through the Everglades, um, we're not only providing for the habitats out in this ecosystem, and, and I'll talk about that briefly uh, after this, but we're also recharging the water supply for those along the Lower East Coast. So from Palm Beach County down through Broward, Miami-Dade, and even into the Florida Keys, uh, they derive their primary water supply from the ground, uh, the aquifer underneath the Everglades uh, that it recharges. So when we have water in the Everglades, we're recharging the water supply uh, for the millions of people, as well as tourists along the Lower East Coast. Now, the habitats that benefit from Everglades restoration, uh, they're, they're maybe subtle to the casual observer, but uh, we think of this ecosystem as being very flat, but actually it has quite a bit of topography. It's just the topography itself is subtle. Now you can have a, a range of six feet or more of elevation change throughout the Everglades. And it's a result of organic peat soils that form over the limestone bedrock. Uh, now, while that limestone bedrock itself might be a relatively flat surface, over time, these habitats have developed with the flow of clean water through the river of grass. And so areas that are deeper, uh, where that flow has been channelized, are sloughs. And these are deeper areas that do have peat soil, but they have, because of that deeper water, they support plants that can exist in those deeper water conditions, like those floating aquatic plants, submerged aquatic plants, um, spike rushes, and some other things. Uh, as you get into the, the middle layer of that topographic zone, we find sawgrass ridges. Now, this is where that water is funneled between as it flows from north to south through the river of grass. Uh, this is what people typically associate with the Everglades sawgrass, uh, and it occupies that mid-level range. The tree islands themselves are the highest elevation habitats in the Everglades. Uh, and this really represents the upland habitat for species that don't like to be wet. Uh, and because it supports trees, that allows birds obviously to nest uh, and, and uh, roost for periods of time while they're uh, building nests and foraging in the Everglades. Now, if you look at these habitats from above, this is actually an image from Google Earth, and it's at approximately 40,000 feet. So if you were flying over the Everglades at altitude, you would see this patterned landscape where the larger teardrop features are the tree islands. Uh, and you can see some of them are quite large and actually quite long. The darker areas are the sloughs. And the more beige colored areas are the sawgrass ridges. Now this is, this is a healthy representation of what those habitats look like from above. Um, it's obviously very attractive, but there's also a functional uh, attribute that makes this pattern landscape quite important. And this illustration shows that. So if you have the deeper areas of sloughs, uh, you can see the sawgrass ridges, and the tree islands offsetting those. As we move through our seasons from wet to dry, and we're in that period of the dry season right now, water levels are receding across the Everglades. And as water levels recede, those smaller crayfish and fish uh, that really represent an important base of the food web uh, start concentrating into pools in these sloughs. And it's at that point where that food concentration occurs across these landscapes that you bring in the, the large number of wading birds that the Everglades was once known for. Um, and this close-up illustration shows how wading birds with different uh, leg length and bill length and their foraging patterns uh, distribute them across these areas as that food concentrates. Um, so we know how the Everglades works. We know that if we get the habitats and the water right, we can do uh, uh, a much better job of protecting wading bird populations in South Florida and reconnect that food chain.
Now, as we get more water south uh, across that finish line into Florida Bay, we can protect this area as well because it's currently not getting enough fresh water uh, from year to year on average, we see that Florida Bay is much saltier than it was historically. Now, when we have a drought, uh, that makes a bad situation even worse to where we can get salinity levels uh, more than twice that of ocean water. That is detrimental to the seagrass habitats down there leads to seagrass die off similar to what we saw in the summer of 2015. Uh, and that leads to a cycle of algae blooms that occur for a number of years, for more than a decade, uh, as we saw in the late 1980s. And we're still seeing impairment in this ecosystem today, although it is recovering at a much more rapid pace than it did following the die off of the late 1980s. So we know getting more fresh water this into the system is beneficial. Restoration also helps to reduce the inequities in water management that we currently see. And many of you are familiar with this. Um, you know that we, we have a, a, an infrastructure and a water management system that was really designed and built for agriculture back in the 1940s. There, was, there wasn't uh, a consideration of the significance of the environment or a tourism based economy that we have in Florida today. So if we just go back to last year, we've got examples of this inequity in, in water management that restoration helps to overcome. Uh, this shows that if we go back to April of last year, roughly around this time, uh, there was no water in the Everglades. In fact, the Everglades was parched, water levels were more than a foot below the surface. Uh, we had fires in Big Cypress, Everglades National Park, and there was very little water uh, moving through. In fact, for quite some time, there was no water moving into Everglades National Park, and Florida Bay was hypersaline yet again. Yet, this large red arrow here illustrates that there was roughly 4 billion gallons of water per day being pulled from Lake Okeechobee for irrigation uh, of those primarily sugar fields in the Everglades agricultural area. So there was obviously water in the system. It's just the environment downstream was not getting any of that. Now, if we move just a couple of months later uh, in 2020, we had a very large rainfall event uh, that dumped a lot of rain in South Florida uh, over a foot in a very short period of time. Now, when it's raining, there isn't a need for irrigation water. So you can see a lot of water going into Lake Okeechobee, but very little water, uh, if at all, going south. In fact, the Everglades agricultural area itself becomes a massive source of stormwater to the Everglades. So in this case, the Everglades got a foot of rainfall, plus it got about another foot of rainfall from all that stormwater in the Everglades. Now, if we go back to the wading bird illustration that I showed you earlier, this really upsets the balance of the ecology of the system because a rapid rise in water levels uh, basically puts an end to the foraging season and the nesting season for those wading birds. So that large of a water level reversal has impacts on the ecology. Uh, and as you can see, we still have problems today moving water because there was so much in the system uh, from that stormwater pulse. Now, this can't go on for too long without discharges to the Caloosahatchee and the St. Lucie occurring. If there's no water going south for irrigation or for the Everglades, which we would like to see more so in the dry season, uh, the lake rises and discharges to the east and west coasts ensue. So again, restoration by sending more water south uh, having that storage, a place to put the water when we have surplus is beneficial to the system. Now, Everglades restoration also uh, builds resilience back into the system, especially considering what we know about climate change and sea level rise. And the National Academy of Sciences has reviewed this, showing that Everglades restoration will improve the, the overall resiliency of the system. It will help to mitigate the impacts of sea level rise and saltwater intrusion. Uh, they have, for the past three reports, evaluated the importance of Everglades restoration relative to these issues uh, that we know will affect South Florida. 
And basically the take home message is not only do we need to restore the Everglades, uh, knowing what we know, we need to do it faster. Now, lastly, I wanna sort of bring all this back around to what we know about Everglades restoration because these are large investments in water infrastructure, but we have the science and we have the understanding to tell us with great confidence that Everglades restoration works. And we also know this based on observation of situations like this year, where we started the year, uh, which is basically the dry season, with a lot of water in the Everglades. This is a map showing uh, in the blue, there's a lot of water throughout the water conservation areas all the way down into Everglades National Park. And with a consistent recession, what we have is uh, uh, basically an optimal condition for wading birds emerging. You can see these blue air, these areas that were once blue in January have now turned to white. Uh, that reflects a gradual recession of water that is made for what could be uh, a monumental year for wading bird foraging. And, and this is the target for restoration. It just so happens that mother nature delivered the water in just the right amount at the right time this year to tell us that restoration is the, the target that we should be aiming for. And we see the same thing with salinity conditions in Florida Bay. Uh, this is a location in central Florida Bay, this blue dot here, and salinities over time. The blue indicates the long-term average, and where you can see that black line dipping below the long-term average, the bay is fresher than it has been in recent history. This is a good thing. We see it in Western Florida Bay as well. Fresher than that recent uh, period of history tells us that we're more mimicking what the natural Everglades and Florida Bay conditions look like. Um, that's important because getting more water into Florida Bay helps us to mitigate that area that's vulnerable to hypersalinity and seagrass die off. And I'll end here with the benefits of this we're seeing already. These are uh, observations from the South Florida Water Management District, just showing uh, unprecedented numbers of wading birds throughout the Everglades as that foraging habitat uh, has opened up with uh, high water at the beginning of the dry season, water level recession throughout. Uh, and, and then of course, as you get closer to the coast, we're seeing anecdotal evidence of the fisheries and, and shorebirds that are responding to this explosion of life, really, that the freshwater inflows to Florida Bay deliver at this time of year. And lastly, I'll just put in a plug for uh, the Everglades Foundation. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, uh, please feel fr free to reach out. My email address is there at the bottom. We also have Sarah Perry, our Director of Development, who's based in Martin County. Uh, you can see her phone number and contact information there as well. So now I'll turn it over to Mark Perry, Executive Director of Florida Oceanographic Society. Hey, thanks, Steve. Uh, that was great to uh, kind of give that overview of what's going on. And, uh, you know, I want to kind of continue on in that same vein. So we're going to we're going to kind of go into how this relates to uh, the estuaries, what we call the northern estuaries, um, both uh, St. Lucie and Indian River Lagoon on the east coast and the Caloosahatchee estuary, river estuary on the west coast. And, and then I'm going to hand it over to Zach at the end to uh, have him kind of wrap up on how really these impacts happen in our coastal area and why it's important that we are understanding what Everglades restoration really does mean for our estuaries as well. Um, so what I wanted to do was to continue um, on, if I can, is this historic flow was on the left. Uh, you can see how the river grass started way up on the upper chain of lakes underneath um, Orlando area, about uh, 11 lakes up there emptied into Lake Kissimmee. And the Kissimmee Valley is like a natural valley flowing from about 60 foot elevation down to the lake uh, Okeechobee, which is at about you know, 14 or 15 feet elevation. So that, that flows down to the south and then continued to overflow um, what we call the river of grass, of course, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas 
wrote about 1948, that very shallow one to two foot uh, deep river of uh, moving water through those sawgrass marshes we know as the Everglades. And as we look to the right, we see how we've currently wanted to get rid of that water and drain the swamp and kind of have to manage and control that water through a series of canals and structures and discharges. And, and what that does is, is cause a lot of issues. But of course, as Steve mentioned back in the 1940s, early 1900s at the turn of the century, in the upper right uh, left here, we wanted to drain the swamp. We wanted to get rid of that useless kind of valueless Everglades full of alligators and mosquitoes and try to attract people here to Florida. And then along came two hurricane events in 1926 and 28, which really devastated our um, uh, population who lived close to the, around the lake, the Glades communities. And um, so then the Herbert Hoover Dyke was authorized in 1930 and completed in 1937, about a 35 foot high dike all around the lake. So this more or less dam uh, dammed the lake from flowing south into, um, into the Everglades. The Army Corps of Engineers is basically the responsible party, along with the Water Management District, to kind of control that lake elevation and make sure that by June 1st, we get down to a low level of the lake in anticipation of hurricane season. So they come up with what they call regulation schedules. And they've developed a regulation schedule in these various bands for allowable releases of Lake Okeechobee to the tide or to the estuaries, namely the St. Lucie Indian River on the East Coast or the Clusatchee on the West, or over to the West, um, down to the South to the water conservation areas to the maximum practical extent. So during a year, they typically look at where the lake level is now and how, how they can be within these certain bands and ranges and develop. And of course, the law, a lot of these squiggly lines show you what a typical year does. So no matter how good we think we are at managing the lake level and controlling this water, it basically is gonna uh, go up and down according to various seasons and changes and dramatic changes in our seasons. Well, they are developing a new Lake Okeechobee regulation schedule right now. It will be out in, in starting in the tw uh, 2022 called the Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual. And we're all very interested in trying to weigh in on how we can better manage the water the, in the watershed to Lake Okeechobee and moving that water south the way nature intended it to go to rehydrate the Everglades and eventually to Florida Bay and not have to damage these coastal estuaries with these regulatory uh, kind of releases. As uh, Steve pointed out and point out again, during a wet season, we primarily see the lake at very high. Uh, this was back in October when we saw a lot of uh, water coming out to both the east and the west coast. But as you can see, not much water coming to the south. So while the estuaries, the northern estuaries, are receiving about 1.2 billion gallons per day, there is zero water in these red areas going through the three canals, S354, 351, and 352 to the south. But there is a lot of water in these stormwater treatment areas going south. These are numbers are in cubic feet per second. But you can see the numbers are very high here going south into the Everglades, into the water conservation areas in the Everglades. This is filling up, but where's that water coming from? It's not coming from the lake. It's actually coming from the Everglades agricultural area, this 700,000 acres south of the lake, which once we dammed the lake became a very fertile ground and very desirable for agriculture. And then, so we named it the Everglades agricultural area and promoted primarily sugarcane growing in over 400,000 acres of that. During the dry season, kind of the opposite happens. We do send a lot of water south to the, uh, from the lake in these numbers, but it's all going to pretty much the irrigation of that agricultural area. And you can see through the stormwater treatment areas and down into the uh, water conservation areas in the Everglades is, is fairly minimal, 14, 415, and zero. So there's a lot of water coming out of the lake now into this Everglades agricultural area, over 1.6 billion gallons a day, but it's, uh, it's pretty much going down 
um, only into irrigation and not into the Everglades. Consequently, we're also getting discharges to the estuaries because the Corps of Engineers is very concerned about the level in the lake at 14 and a half or 15 feet uh, going into our wet season uh, coming up in June 1st, they're very concerned that we may get a, a detrimental effect. So what happens overall to the estuaries is not only do we receive a lot of fresh water, but along with it, a lot of phosphorus and nitrogen and total suspended solids, that's the silt and sediment that's stirred up in the water uh, with those discharges and releases to the estuaries. Now, we combine the phosphorus and nitrogen and call it nutrients. And nutrients are good things. Uh, everything needs nutrients to live and, and, and metabolize. But if too much phosphorus, too much nitrogen, particularly nitrogen in, in estuary systems is very detrimental and can cause algae blooms and other big issues. Also the total suspended solids, I mean, 35 million pounds is quite a lot in one year to come into this estuary and settle on the bottom and stir up the water for uh, the light penetration can't make the seagrass grow. So it's a very concerning issue. And in the meantime, the agricultural runoff is continuing to fill up the Everglades and also they're getting water supply. So here we are connected to Lake Okeechobee. The St. Lucie Canal built 1916 to 1926. And then remember after the Herbert Hoover Dyke was built, they improved the St. Lucie Canal to be the, one of the major outlets um, of the lake and when it gets too high. So they engineered it and controlling that and, and put it into the south fork of the St. Lucie River. We also have other agricultural canals that are not connected to the lake that drain these lands in the north part of Mark County, South St. Lucie County, primarily for citrus groves. And that is C23, C24, and C25 canals. But the C44 is the main canal that they tied into the south fork, the natural south fork of the river. Back historically, you can see the watershed of the St. Lucie Estuary, River Estuary, was about 20 miles to the north of Stewart as the north winding north fork of the river came south in the watershed to Stewart. The south fork about 10 and a half miles to the south came winding up to Stewart and they both joined together in the middle estuary and connected to the Atlantic Ocean through the St. Lucie Inlet and of course the Indian River Lagoon, uh, providing this estuary, the mixture of that salt water from the ocean and the fresh water from the watershed. But when we connected these canals and C44, particularly those big canals, we increased a more than doubled the size of our uh, watershed and artificially in, in, in kind of introduced all of this fresh water to runoff in order to drain lands for those agricultural purposes. So consequently, the, the C44 canal enters into the St. Lucie Estuary right here at what we call the structure S80. And S80 is uh, seven of these floodgates, which discharge from the right hand of the screen over to the left. Um, this can produce about seven and a half uh, million, or, you know, seven, over 7,000 cubic feet per second and, and close to over four, you know, four million billion gallons a day. I mean, this is a lot of water pouring through. You can also see the locks in the boats um, locking in the structure on the top part of the photo. And that basically is because they're going from sea level on the estuary side to whatever the canal or lake level is, let's say 14 and a half feet. So they have to come into the locks, they close the locks, they let the water get up to that level and they allow the boats to go on the Okeechobee waterway across to um, Lake Okeechobee. So since we've known the problem and the issues, we've struggled with what are we gonna do about how can we fix it? And Congress authorized the uh, Corps of Engineers to restudy this whole Central South Florida flood control issue back in the 1990s. And in year 2000 said, we have to have some projects and programs that help to restore those. So in our area, the Indian River Lagoon South Plan calls for two components to the C44 basin, which has a reservoir and stormwater treatment areas taking water from that C44 basin before it runs out into the estuary, storing it and treating it and letting it go slowly into there. We've also included um, natural storage areas for water 
and other things to remediate that water so that it comes in more naturally to the south and the north fork of the St. Lucie. The Corps of Engineers and, and the Water District also have what they call an integrated delivery schedule. Over 68 different projects that were identified in the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, part of which is up in our coast and over the west coast and down south. But these components are very slow moving. And since year 2000, we've only been kind of working on about 14 or so different projects. They're very expensive, hard to work on, hard to get through Congress. But it's a 50-50 program between the federal and the state appropriations. So uh, we're fortunate to have federal partners, but it's, got, it's slow going to get this restoration. And as Steve mentioned, one of those important projects that are on our minds right now is moving that water south to what we call the Everglades Agricultural Area Storage Reservoir and STA. And that's in these A2 and A1 areas um, that are south of the lake where we can bring lake water down, store it and treat it and move it south um, to eliminate or reduce at, less, at least reduce some of those discharges to the St. Lucie and Clusatchee estuary. So what we ultimately want to end up with is, is the historic flows we can maybe never get back to, but the current flows are way too damaging to the northern estuaries and, and don't put enough water south to the Everglades in Florida Bay that really needs it, as Steve demonstrated. But we really need some desired flow from the Kissimmee Valley slowly into the lake and slowly overflow that into uh, the Everglades and not have these damaging discharges um, to the east and west estuaries. So I'm really you know, going to end there and kind of we're going to talk some more and discuss some more about that detail. And I want to turn it over to Dr. Zach Judd, who's our director of education, and, and, and he has a scientist that has truly come into knowing more about our estuary and what's going on. So, Zach, why don't you take it away? Mark, thank you so much, and, and Steve as well. Mark and Steve did a really good job of describing how, over the last century or so, Florida's plumbing has become broken. What I wanna to do tonight is talk a little bit about some of the environmental impacts of that broken plumbing, specifically for us here on the Treasure Coast, looking at the effects of Lake Okeechobee discharges on the health of our coastal estuaries. Uh, here in, in my part of Florida, the coastal estuaries that we worry about the most are the, the St. Lucie and Indian River Lagoon estuaries. Obviously our friends across the, sta the state in the Fort Myers area live on the, the Clusahatchee estuary and they're dealing with many of the same environmental problems. This is one of my favorite maps of Florida. It's from 1856, and it really gives you a great overview of what our state used to look like. This is probably the oldest but most detailed map I've been able to find. And you can see how, how much of our state used to be the Everglades, starting up here in the Kissimmee Chain of Lakes, through the winding and twisting and turning Oxbowed Kissimmee River into Lake Okeechobee itself. And historically, the lake was much bigger than it is today. It would swell during the wet season. It would contract during the dry season. And the river of grass, the, the Everglades that we think of today, started just south of Lake Okeechobee as water from the lake slowly overflowed and spread out on its journey all the way from the lake down to Florida Bay. So you're looking at South Florida with a river that was at one time 40 miles wide, 100 miles long, only a few feet deep in most places, but, but still a river of grass, as Marjorie Stoneman Douglas coined the term. But you'll notice in this picture, there are no natural connections between Lake Okeechobee and the St. Lucie Estuary and Lake Okeechobee and the Caloosahatchee Estuary. Those were entirely man-made connections that were you know, part of Florida's efforts to, to drain the Everglades, to create more usable land, both for agriculture and urban development. And those connections are really at the heart of a lot of our issues here in coastal Florida. And some of the issues that we're dealing with include algae blooms, salinity alteration, and water quality issues. And there's, there's more than that, but for tonight, those are the ones that I'm going to try to touch on. And I'm going to start with algae. You know, algae are in the news a lot. We hear a lot about harmful algae blooms and toxic algae, but I, I want you to understand that not all algae are harmful. There are thousands and thousands of different types of algae on our planet. Many of them are, are quite beneficial. Something like this. This is sargasm. It's a type of floating brown algae that provides home for hundreds, if not thousands, of other organisms. You can see in this one shot, there are 
countless little fish swimming around. There are probably little sea turtles floating on top of this. There's some, some jellyfish in there. This positive type of algae becomes a home for, for lots of animals. And the same thing applies to things like the giant kelp forests we find in the Pacific Northwest. Kelp is a form of algae. So when we think about algae, we're thinking about things that are kind of like plants. They're not exactly plants, but they're, they're pretty similar. They have a lot of the same physiology. They take sunlight and carbon dioxide, and through the process of photosynthesis, they give off oxygen. Certain types of algae, like kelp, look a little bit like plants, but not all of them look plant-like. In general, there are two broad categories of algae. There are macroalgae, things you can easily see with your naked eye. So sargasm and kelp, like we looked at a minute ago, are considered macroalgae. And then we also have microalgae. These are organisms that you need a microscope to see. The other name for microalgae is zooplankton. So when you hear somebody, I'm sorry, phytoplankton, not zooplankton. When you hear somebody talking about a phytoplankton bloom, that's synonymous with an algae bloom. In Florida, we're dealing with a number of different types of harmful algae blooms. These are, these are blooms that can present issues with, with human health and the health of our wildlife and overall the health of our waterways. And many of our harmful algae blooms are caused by microalgae, the ones you need a microscope to see. And it's really important to note that a lot of Florida's harmful algae blooms are not directly linked to Lake Okeechobee discharges. So I'm gonna start my presentation tonight by talking about something that really isn't related to the Everglades and really isn't related to Lake Okeechobee discharges, but is still an important part of our coastal story because our beautiful Indian River Lagoon is connected to the St. Lucie River at its southern end. So issues that are affecting the Indian River Lagoon are, are important to us, but it's also really you know, critical to understand that not all of those Indian River Lagoon issues are directly driven by Lake Okeechobee discharges. So you see here on, on the right, a satellite image showing the Northern Indian River Lagoon, the Banana River Lagoon and Mosquito Lagoon, and they're looking pretty green. This is an image of a type of non-toxic algae growing in the Northern Indian River Lagoon system that isn't fueled by anything related to the Everglades or Lake Okeechobee. But it's still really important that we understand how this process works and it'll lead us to some of the other blooms that are more um, directly attributed to discharges coming out of the lake. This is a picture from the winter of 2020, 2021. So this is a recent photo showing a bloom in the Northern Indian River Lagoon, making our water look like pea soup. Again, not toxic. This isn't the toxic stuff yet, but it's still pretty problematic. Here's another bloom from the Northern Indian River Lagoon. I guess this one's a little bit more chocolate milk brown rather than pea soup green. And this is an important one. This is an organism called Ario umbra. Tiny little dots under a microscope, not much to see, but to the naked eye, the water gets really opaque and brown. We didn't see blooms of Ario umbra in the Indian River Lagoon until a, a little bit less than a decade ago. But when they came in, they caused huge environmental harm. One of the things that these blooms do is they prevent sunlight from reaching the bottom of the estuary. And as a result, those seagrass beds that, that make the Indian River Lagoon such a diverse place, in fact, one of the most uh, biodiverse estuaries in North America, those seagrass beds start to suffer. In the Northern Indian River Lagoon, we've lost more than 50,000 acres of seagrass since 2011, and it happened pretty quickly. You can see these images uh, show the same area in the Banana River, which is part of the Northern Indian River Lagoon. In 2009, there was a band of seagrass extending at least a quarter mile from shore for 20 plus miles along the western shoreline of the Banana River. This was just a blanket of lush seagrass. In 2011 and 2012, the area experienced some major algae blooms, including that Ario umbra, the, the chocolate milk stuff I showed you a minute ago. And those blooms essentially wiped out all of the seagrass in this region. And I know the map on the right is 2013, but I can assure you, I fish this area regularly. There's no seagrass left up there. It's completely and totally gone. The bottom is sand now. And that's a result of a bloom of algae blocking sunlight from reaching the bottom of the estuary. So it's a mechanical issue. And if you've seen any of these news stories over the last two weeks or so about Florida's really high manatee mortality rate in 2021, most of those manatee deaths are attributed to starvation. Manatees graze on seagrass meadows. When you look at an estuary that's lost most of its seagrass, there's just no food left for the manatees to eat. 
I've heard some numbers thrown around that the Indian River has lost 50 or 60 percent of its seagrass. I would argue that the number is far higher than that. I, you know, I'm, I'm out in the water a lot. I, I, I can't think of anywhere right now that I could take you and show you a seagrass bed. It, from Ponce Inlet to Jupiter, there are very few places left where we even have a, a little seagrass stubble trying to grow back. Imagine being a manatee that you know, eats 100 plus pounds of grass a day in an ecosystem that just doesn't have any grass left to support them. So this is an example of a trickle down effect of an algae bloom wiping out an important ecosystem, our seagrass beds, and then having an impact on a charismatic animal like the manatee. Even though these blooms in the Northern Indian River Lagoon are not toxic, they can sometimes lead to scenes like this. This was a massive fish kill in uh, March of 2016. Actually, it was, it was just, just about this week, five years ago. And this, I, I took the time to count these fish one day, and it's about 6,000 fish in this one photograph. Imagine 30 miles of this. The entire northern part of the Banana River died in two days. So even though the bloom wasn't toxic, it did something that affected these fish. And it turns out that something involves oxygen. Normally, algae give off oxygen since they're a plant-like organism. But during really bad blooms, there are uh, certain circumstances that can cause oxygen to get taken up, either by the algae itself, or if the bloom dies, bacteria move in and the bacterial decay slurp up oxygen and you end up with fish that suffocate in the water. So we have to think about what's triggering these algae blooms. And that's where nutrients come in. Mark and Steve both mentioned nutrients. And you know, I, I always want to caution people to, to think about nutrients in a good way most of the time and in a bad way some of the time. Nutrients are important. They're substances that provide nourishment for growth and maintenance of life. In humans, we think about um, macronutrients like carbohydrates and proteins and fats that sustain our growth. We also think about micronutrients, things like copper and iron and zinc that are critical for our survival, but only in very small amounts. In our case, if we have too much of something like iron, we can get sick. In the case of our estuaries, if you have too much of something like nitrogen and phosphorus, that's where we run into these algae blooms. And I'm gonna make a huge oversimplification here, but almost all of our nutrient problems come from two broad sources, fertilizer and waste. Now fertilizer can mean a lot of things. It can mean um, industrial level agriculture. It could mean golf courses and parks. It can even mean our own backyards. We have a, an unhealthy obsession with bright green grass. I, I hate to be blunt about it, but if you live in Florida and you apply fertilizer to your yard, you are a little tiny, tiny part of our water quality issues. We could also think about the mining of phosphate. We, we have a phosphate mining industry in Florida and that goes into producing fertilizer, but it also affects water quality, particularly on the west coast of our state. And then separate from fertilizer, we have to think about waste. Animal waste is a big deal in Florida. Agriculture produces a lot of waste, whether it's dairy cows, beef cows, poultry. And we also have to think about human waste. It's sad to say, but Florida has a pretty big sewage problem. It seems like every week we hear something in the news about a sewage treatment plant that's malfunctioned and is now dumping water into the Indian River Lagoon. We hear about ruptured sewer pipes all the time. We also hear about septic tanks. In, in the simplest sense, a septic tank is a very small wastewater treatment plant that you bury in your backyard and they do a reasonably good job of cleaning up your waste in certain areas. Septic tanks typically rely on bacteria that live in the soil to break down some of the components of the stuff you flush. The problem is in Florida, we don't have soil. We have a little bit of sand, we've got porous limestone rock, and then immediately below that, we have our water table. So septic really doesn't work well in Florida. It's not just about broken septic or old septic or malfunctioning septic. If you put a perfectly brand new state-of-the-art septic tank into an area that has a water table just two feet below ground, you're gonna be contributing nutrients into our groundwater. And we've seen now that those nutrients are able to travel laterally through the groundwater and they get back into our estuaries, fueling the blooms of algae that we're talking about tonight. Now we looked at a fish kill a minute ago that was caused by dissolved oxygen, but there's another type of algae growing in coastal Florida that can cause fish kills in a different way. And of course I'm thinking of the red tide. The red tide is another tiny little microscopic organism, but it produces a, a potent neurotoxin called brevitoxin. And that brevitoxin affects fish as well as much bigger animals, things like manatees, dolphins, sea turtles. 
even human beings. If I had to guess, uh, you know, we have a, about 160 people watching tonight. I, I'm, I'm assuming that some of you have probably been to the beach during a red tide and felt, you know, how, how badly it can impact your lungs, your mouth, your nose, your eyes. For me, I get an immediate cough that I can't stop until I leave the area. You know, imagine being a fish or a manatee or a dolphin swimming through that, that toxic soup produced by this microscopic organism. The same nutrient pollution that we talked about a minute ago, nitrogen and phosphorus from us, is, is like throwing gasoline on a fire when we think about the red tide. The red tide is not a new phenomenon. There, there are documented accounts from you know, sailors in the 1500s talking about the red tide in the Gulf of Mexico. But in recent years, we've seen the red tide occurring over a larger geographical area, closer to shore, and lasting for a longer period of time. And that's very likely a result of all the nutrients flowing from coastal estuaries into primarily the Gulf of Mexico. But as Steve mentioned, during really bad red tides like we had in 2018, these blooms can wrap all the way around our state and affect us here on the East Coast as well. We had, a, we had a pretty extensive red tide not that long ago, two years ago, that caused fish kills in the Treasure Coast. And again, if you look at the outlet of the Caloosahatchee River and the St. Lucie River, during a red tide, both of those waterways can add fuel to the algae bloom. Now, as bad as the red tide is, it pales in comparison to the bright green guacamole that we see on the news from time to time. This picture was taken in Stewart. This is, this is something called cyanobacteria. It's also known as blue-green algae. Those words are completely interchangeable. They mean the exact same thing. The species that we deal with in our area is called microcystis. Again, just little tiny organisms under the microscope, but they can cause some big problems. So like we said earlier, there are lots of types of algae on earth. Some are bad, some are good. The same thing applies to cyanobacteria. There are thousands of different types of cyanobacteria on our planet. Not all of them are bad. If you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park and seen prismatic hot springs, the different shades of yellow and orange and brown that you see surrounding the hot springs, those are cyanobacteria, obviously a, a good type, but not all cyanobacteria are positive. The one that we have here in Stewart, the microcystis, that's a scary one. It is highly toxic, toxic to, to wildlife, to pets, even to humans. Very short-term exposure to microcystis, say in your drinking water, for example, can cause severe liver damage. And now there's growing evidence to suggest that long-term exposure to microcystis might be linked to human diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and ALS. This is, this is scary stuff. And thankfully, there are a lot of researchers working to try to understand this relationship better. But the evidence is compelling and growing. Now, the interesting thing about blooms like this is that they can switch from toxic to non-toxic in the blink of an eye. And we really don't understand what makes a blue-green algae bloom go from non-toxic to toxic. And kind of the other scary thing is they produce toxins that we aren't even testing for. Th these are little you know, chemical factories, and they're able to produce things that, that either are very difficult to test for or aren't even on our radar necessarily. And they've been in the news a lot lately. This is not just a Florida story. You know, obviously, we're talking about the Everglades and our coastal estuaries tonight. But blooms of blue-green algae are happening more and more frequently in recent years likely linked to an increase in water pollution as well as climate change. Parts of our planet are warming up a little bit. That warm polluted water is what fuels blooms of cyanobacteria. This was a story from Botswana. Over 300 elephants were found dead around some watering holes that were, that were filled with blue-green algae. There have been a bunch of stories from around the United States about dogs getting sick or even dying after swimming in ponds and lakes that were experiencing blooms of blue-green algae. And then we have Toledo, Ohio. Toledo gets their drinking water from Lake Erie, and Lake Erie has huge blooms of microcystis during the summer. So it's the same species we're dealing with here in Florida. It got so bad a few years ago that Toledo had to shut down their municipal drinking water supply for almost a half a million people. This is, this is really bad stuff, and we're sitting right at the epicenter of these blooms here in Florida. But there's a little twist. Microcystis doesn't like salt water. It's a freshwater organism. It dies when it gets exposed to brackish or salty water. So if that's the case, why are we so worried about it here in coastal Florida? The Clusahatchee and St. Lucie rivers are, you know, hotbeds for stories related to blue-green algae, but it doesn't really thrive in those environments. Well, unfortunately, our blooms are being dumped on us from Lake Okeechobee.
that plumbing that Mark and Steve talked about, that's why we're dealing with microcystis here in coastal Florida. So you look at the historical Everglades, there wasn't any water leaving the lake to the east or the west. Now that we have the 700,000 acre agricultural area acting as a, a giant roadblock to Everglades restoration, we have to send that water somewhere and into our estuaries it goes. The lake itself is where the blooms originate. Mark mentioned all the nitrogen and phosphorus coming into the lake from the north. There's also a legacy of nutrients from 100 years of intensive agriculture packed into the muck on the bottom of the lake. So between the nutrients running into the lake from the north today and all the additional nitrogen and phosphorus trapped in the sediments of the lake from you know, centuries or decades ago, this lake is a cauldron during the summer that really is conducive to the, to the growth of blue-green algae. Some years it covers as much as 90% of the lake surface. You can see it from outer space. And unfortunately, if you look closely, here is one outlet for the lake, the C44 canal that leads to Stewart. Down here under the clouds is the C43 canal that leads to the Coosahatchee River. Those are the canals that are delivering blue-green algae from the lake directly to our coastal estuaries, including the St. Lucie and Indian River Lagoon. And you can see this clearly from the air. The first picture shows a view of Lake Okeechobee looking east into the, the start of the C44 canal. So I'm flowing east. And then if you flew further down river, you'd see more microcystis moving along from east, uh, from west to east rather. And it runs into that S80 flood control structure. Basically this structure delineates the C44 canal from water flowing into the St. Lucie estuary. Just connect the dots from the lake to the canal, from the canal to the estuary. There's no question about it. This is a bloom that is fueled by the lake and dumped into our community because of broken infrastructure. But it's not just about cyanobacteria. That's the most important story I wanted to tell you tonight, but we also have to think about what these discharges do to water quality in other ways. Both salinity and sediment and turbidity are impacting the health of our estuary. This is an incredible picture of the St. Lucie Inlet on a clear day. And uh, kind of a neat fact, if any of you have ever done any scuba diving in the Florida Keys or the Tortugas, the Florida Reef Track runs in one continuous ribbon from the Keys all the way up to St. Lucie Inlet. This is the northern end of the Florida Reef Track. So there are living corals on this reef. Look what happens during a Lake Okeechobee discharge. Massive plumes of murky, sediment-laden freshwater run miles out to sea. These smother our reefs and they have a terrible impact on our seagrass beds. I talked to you earlier about seagrass die-off in the northern Indian River Lagoon related to um, algae blooms shading the, the, the grasses. In our part of the Indian River Lagoon, a lot of our seagrass die-off is related to salinity and turbidity. When you have dirty fresh water covering a seagrass bed for weeks or months, the grasses start to die. And you could see that in 2016, we had a, we had a really substantial discharge out of Lake Okeechobee. Um, between the Caloosahatchee and St. Lucie sides, we got around 700 billion gallons in 2016. The seagrass meadows that once covered a couple hundred acres inside of the St. Lucie Inlet were wiped out in one year. And to this day, there's hardly any seagrass left in that area. This, this is all mostly sand. Now, what I will tell you, when you have a good year without any freshwater coming out of Lake Okeechobee, these grasses try to recover. And that's a big part of why Florida Oceanographic Society is pioneering seagrass restoration techniques so that we understand better how to grow it in captivity and restore it back into the wild once water conditions improve a little bit. It is resilient to a degree, but when you have year after year of heavy discharges, the, the seagrass beds can't survive that. And this is important because our seagrass beds provide a home for dozens of environmentally important species, but also economically important species. All of the, the inshore game fish that we like to go fishing for, snook, tarp, and redfish, they utilize these seagrass beds as their home at one point or another during their life. And you could say the same thing about our oyster reefs. Oysters are a urihaline species, meaning they can live in brackish water. They, they actually do best in brackish water, but they can't handle water that's too fresh. When you get below about 10 parts per thousand, and that's uh, in reference to seawater. Seawater is about 35 parts per thousand. When you're at 10 parts per thousand or lower, oysters become stressed. When you're below five parts per thousand, they start to die. Uh, for little oysters, 
they can only survive for about a week in, in that fresh water. For adult oysters, you're looking at a couple of weeks at most. During 2018, we had 127 days of suboptimal salinity in the St. Lucie estuary for our precious oyster beds. These oysters provide habitat just like seagrass. They also filter our water. They act as a filter mechanism, but only if they're alive. And, and again, like I said, with seagrass, uh, Florida Oceanographic Society has been doing oyster restoration for more than a decade to try to address some of these issues. In addition to oysters and seagrass, low salinity can have direct impacts on a lot of game fish species. Species like spotted sea trout that, that use the estuary for spawning, their eggs and larvae aren't able to survive during a heavy pulse of fresh water coming out of the lake. Remember, these fish are, are you know, adapted to an estuary that was not historically connected to the lake. They're not they're not built to handle big periods of prolonged freshwater discharge. And the very last thing I wanna leave everybody with is, is just a, a simple thought, but I think, I think sometimes this is lost. I'm an environmental person, but I'm also a, a, an, an angler, a, a scuba diver, a, a, a kayaker, a paddleboarder. I love the water. So it doesn't take a lot for me to understand that environmental issues equal economic issues, but sometimes that's lost. I, I think when we talk about the environment, you sometimes think just about you know, the, the, the tree hugger sect, the people that really have devoted their entire lives to caring about the environment at all costs. But I urge you to start thinking about it differently. You know, here in Florida, our clean waters drive our economy. Tourism is so important to our state and especially in coastal areas where, where tourism involves beach going and fishing and diving and paddle boarding and windsurfing. When you're dealing with these Lake Okeechobee discharges and toxic cyanobacteria, it's really quickly apparent that we're not just dealing with environmental issues, we're dealing with human health issues and economic issues as well. We're at an interesting point in time right now when we think about Everglades restoration. And, and I have to say that, that all of you are the reason why we're at that interesting point. I, I would argue that many of our issues right now are, are political. We understand the science behind Everglades restoration we need leaders who are willing to support what the science is saying. And in the last few years, we're starting to see some positive momentum on both sides of the aisle. And all of you are the only reason we're seeing that momentum. Your little voices are starting to add up. The, the small gestures like signing a petition or going to a rally or even maybe speaking on microphone at an event, those little gestures really work. So I, I, I want to encourage you to keep Keep doing little things. Maybe it's a, a change in your lifestyle to minimize your impact on the environment, like giving up fertilizer. You can have a green lawn in Florida without fertilizer, I promise. I want you to keep learning. And ultimately, I want you to use your knowledge both to share it with other people who maybe aren't as passionate as you are, and most importantly, to help, to help vote people into office who are willing to, to fix these important problems for us. Alrighty, folks. Well, I want to thank all of you wholeheartedly. It's such a treat to be able to talk about such an important topic to a group of people that, I, that I'm pretty certain are, are fairly savvy and fairly passionate. I hope all of you have learned something from, from Mark, Steve, and myself tonight, but this is your chance to start typing in questions. If you have any questions at all, go ahead and type them in, and I'm going to ask Mark and Steve to turn their cameras back on and uh, unmute themselves, and the three of us will do our best to go through your questions. I see we already have some pouring in throughout the evening. So uh, first question, how will sea level rise affect Everglades restoration efforts? What a great question. Steve, do you wanna, do you wanna take that one since you mentioned sea level rise? I, I'm happy to take a stab at that, Zach. Um, so when you think of the Everglades, it's a, it's a, you know, a low lying, relatively low sloping landscape. So as sea level has occurred over the past century to the tune of nine or more inches, uh, that has allowed saltwater to penetrate further uh, inland. And on the surface, that changes habitats. Habitats that were once freshwater are now saltwater uh, and are undergoing more extreme transformation um, as, as those plants that are sensitive to the salinity are dying back. Um, so habitats are changing. Saltwater is intruding. We also know that because we've cut off the flow of fresh water into Everglades National Park, that's really exacerbated that inland saltwater intrusion on the surface. Now beneath the surface, 
Uh, those of us that live down here and depend on the Everglades for our water supply, that's also put our water supply at risk. Um, that porous geology that we have here, that, that limestone bedrock has allowed for saltwater to penetrate further inland. And again, because we've cut off the flow of fresh water to the ecosystem, we've exacerbated that. Now we can't stop sea level rise, but we know by restoring fresh water flow back to the south, sending more water south into the park, ultimately down to Florida Bay, we can slow those impacts and allow these, these habitats, these ecosystems to respond to a more gradual transformation. Um, so we know that, that those changes are occurring. We know that Everglades restoration will help. And that's also the feedback that we've been getting from the National Academy of Sciences. So both Mark and Steve showed a, a number of figures with uh, flow measurements. And Steve also showed that map that, that showed water depth across Big Cypress and Everglades National Park shifting from blue to red. Somebody was curious how water flow and water depth are measured. Uh, are those maps derived using satellite data? Well, I'll just, I'll start with that. Um, the, the water depth maps, um, we, we have really good topographic data across the Everglades. And in concert with that, we have an incredible network of water gauge stations throughout the Everglades. Um, and, and we're really blessed with that kind of information uh, in South Florida that helps us to understand how the system responds to management and how it's improving because of Everglades restoration. Uh, so th there's, a, there's a great network of data sites available that provide that information for us, including the flows from the US Geological Survey. And Mark, you might wanna talk more about that. Yeah, yeah, sure. The flows are usually measured by a flow meter, uh, which is put in a location near a structure, let's say, or near a creek or canal, so that when that water is flowing past that meter, it's telling you how many cubic feet per second are coming across. And then you translate that to the area of which that is monitoring, and you'll, you can calculate the volume of that water that's flowing through there. The same thing is with nutrients. Uh, we can determine the concentration of those nutrients coming through like phosphorus or nitrogen, and then extrapolate that to the volume of water uh, which contains those nutrients. And you can get a load or a, a load of how many metric tons or pounds of nitrogen or phosphorus are entering into a system. So it's all done, the measurements with meters. Uh, sometimes those are used with Doppler kind of system like a like a policeman might monitor your speed running through, you can Doppler measure those, but mostly it's uh, with the old flow meters uh, put into those uh, water systems that are flowing. Yeah, good question. So we have a, a kind of an advocacy question. Would Florida Oceanographic Society or the Everglades Foundation ever advocate for a sugar consumption tax? Yeah, I think we, we have in the past. Um, and back in the 1990s, there was a, an, an effort to advocate for polluter pay amendment to the Florida Constitution. And the polluters pay amendment was directed to those who are translating all of that pollution, namely phosphorus, uh, from the Everglades ag agricultural area into the Everglades. And it was determined that they have to you know, pay for that uh, pollution to be happening. Well, there was a agricultural privilege tax which we got applied and in some respects that is kind of a tax that they are in, inspired to do about $25 per acre which amounts to about 11 million dollars a year however it takes us about 20 million dollars a year to maintain our uh, stormwater treatment areas which are those filter marshes that treat that a consumption tax is um, more people might refer to the farm bill which is a federal farm bill um, that comes up every five years. And in that we're protecting the domestic prices of sugar at 18 to 22 cents a pound, whereas the world market pricing is about eight or nine cents a pound. So domestic sugar has the protection of that and it's uh, kind of a reverse of a consumption tax. It's actually a, an addition to, so we're, we're supporting through price supports and import quotas um, the domestic sugar in our area, unfortunately. So a lot of people are concerned about, let's get that, uh, that support out of that farm bill 
uh, for this industry, particularly because it is um, causing a, a lot of detriment to the um, Everglades and the ecosystem. Good question. So I, I think I'm going to field our next one. Uh, so if, if the goal is to discharge more water south, won't that cause the same types of algae blooms that we're seeing on the east and west coast, just shifting them further south? How, you know, how do you prevent that phosphorus from reaching Florida Bay? So this, this is a good question. Both Mark and Steve used the phrase STA today, stormwater treatment area. These are large, highly engineered, managed wetlands that use different types of aquatic plants to basically scrub the nutrients out of water. So behind me, I've got a coral reef fish tank and I actually use algae as part of my filtration to pull nitrogen and phosphorus out of my aquarium water. And STA works the exact same way, but on the scale of thousands of acres. And these STAs work. Florida already has six STAs that filter water before it goes into the Everglades. But the six that we currently have are primarily filtering water from the Everglades agricultural area. It's, it's basically filters for farmers rather than filters for Lake Okeechobee. And the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir that you learned about tonight will have a large filtration component to it, a, a, an STA component to it. So the idea of sending water south isn't just about sending water south. If you were to send water south without cleaning it first, it would, it would harm the Everglades. The Everglades doesn't like nitrogen and phosphorus. It's a system that grew up without a whole lot of fertilizer in it. And while most plants grow really well when you fertilize them, a lot of the native plants that make the Everglades so special have the opposite reaction. So sending water south isn't enough. We have to send clean water south. Part of that comes from cleaning up water coming into the lake, but part of it is also about cleaning up the water as it goes south. And hopefully this Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir and STA will be able to allow us to send water south, but while at the same time using these vegetated wetlands basically as enormous filters for that water. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, yeah, let's see here. Uh, why doesn't Florida enforce its own clean water laws? Why doesn't Florida tax polluters to pay for the damage that they're causing? That's such an important question. Mark, do you want to start with that one? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's real difficult to kind of pin down as to why we're not uh, enforcing our laws. When the Clean Water Act was passed in 1972, we thought, well, okay, we're all, all done. The federal government, EPA, is going to take over the Clean Water Act. But it delegated it a lot to the states um, to enforce their own Clean Water Acts. In the state of Florida, unfortunately, we set up a system of what we call recognizing impaired water bodies, uh, impaired for certain nutrient levels or oxygen or other things that are impaired or polluted. So they then began to establish a total maximum daily load for these water bodies. And when they established that, they said, okay, nothing should exceed that. They said the best way to achieve that is to go into the basin management action plans. And those are 15 year plans in each of these regional areas in Florida in order to try to in encourage them to use best management practices and other kind of activities in order to reduce those nutrient outflows and meet that total maximum daily load for that water body. Unfortunately, that system doesn't work. And it's unfortunate that it's not enforceable to a point where if you or I were putting in water into a, a state water body and it's polluted, we should be you know, um, regulated and stopped and fined uh, heavily for polluting our, our state waters. And we need to go upstream and find out where the pollution is coming from. We pretty much know by each watershed and subwatershed. And we need to enforce the existing laws, as you mentioned on the books, um, to not pollute the waters as it goes downstream in the watershed to the waters of the state. So we do have a system in place. We should be enforcing our own water quality laws. And unfortunately, it's not it's not being done. And a lot of times they say, well, the regulatory agencies are overtaxed and we can't get out there with enough people to do it. And it's uh, unfortunate, but we need to do it. Good point. Zach, I'll just add, when, when it comes to um, water bodies like Lake Okeechobee, uh, it, it's not just a matter of shutting off the pollution coming in. Because that lake has, has endured uh, 
loads of pollution for so many decades now, there is a legacy of pollution in the bottom of the lake that is such a great amount that even if we could put distilled water into Lake Okeechobee tomorrow, it's still going to be an impaired water body for years, if not decades to come because of all of that legacy uh, pollution in the bottom of the lake. So, um, you know, while we certainly need to take action on uh, stopping those pollutants at the source, we've got a situation in Lake Okeechobee where there really isn't a, a feasible solution to cleaning up that water body. And, and from, you know, the perspective of Everglades restoration, again, by redirecting that water south and taking advantage of those stormwater treatment areas, that system of, of treatment wetlands that we have, we can clean that water before it goes to the Everglades and at the same time reduce that, that uh, discharge of polluted water going to the east and west coast. Our next question is about the Kissimmee River. The, uh, the viewer wonders how successful efforts to restore the Kissimmee River have been to date, and is there still more work going on to continue restoring the Kissimmee? Yeah, the, uh, actually it, it, it got a late start, even though it uh, recognized that as soon as the meandering Kissimmee River, about 105 miles long, had a natural two mile wide floodplain uh, which would get real wet and flood and slow the water flow about six or eight months to get to Lake Okeechobee. But in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, we built a canal right up the middle of the Oxbow River at C-38 Canal, which then only took two or three days as soon as it rains in the upper chain to come straight down, of course, bringing all that pollution. We recognized early on we need to restore the Kissimmee, return those Oxbows. And they restored about 22 miles of those oxbow areas. And I've been up there and seen it's a beautiful system. It's a very naturally clean water now with a lot of returning alligators and fish and everything. And the, and the floodplain is restored too. So it gets real wet at floods. So restoring the Kissimmee is important. It's been slow going and understanding, but finally that section and those areas in the lower Kissimmee Valley will be restored and the target end date is 2022. So, so we're really close now to getting that final push. That'll slow that water, treat that water before it gets into Lake Okeechobee, which will help in, in that kind of source control of the water coming into the lake. Good question. All right, next question is about fish. Are there times when it's not safe to eat fish out of Lake Okeechobee due to the toxic cyanobacteria? That's a tough question. So. The state of Florida does test our water for the presence of certain toxins that are created by certain types of algae. The problem is the testing, in my opinion, is inadequate. If you call and report an algae bloom, somebody will come out and scoop the water up, take it to a lab and test it, and they will let you know at that moment whether there are certain toxins present, whether it's safe to swim in the water or drink the water or contact it, but they're only testing when the green stuff is visible. They don't typically come back and test weeks later to see if there's any lingering toxins. The state doesn't typically test for toxins in the sediment. They don't typically test for toxins in the crabs, the shrimp and the fish that our game fish like to eat. They don't typically test for toxins in the tissue of the actual fish that we're eating. So I guess the answer is we really don't know. They, they um, the state of Florida will go out and test the water and let you know acutely at that moment that you might not want to contact it, you might not want to drink it, you certainly might not want to fish in it. But there's a, a real data gap in terms of the long-term effects of some of these toxins on the food that we eat. And really the only research that, that's, that's looking into it is academic. A lot of, of state-level research is sort of skipping around the touchy topic of the real long-term impacts of exposure to toxic algae and that, that leaves it up to university scientists. Thankfully, there's been a, a tremendous push in the last couple of years to try to understand these issues better. And, and that includes looking at the overall health of not just the water, but the animals that live in the water, the animals that, that we consume. So long answer shortened is we really don't always know the answer. I know personally, I, as an angler, won't eat fish out of the St. Lucie River anymore. Even when it's not discharging, I just know that there's a legacy of toxins flowing into the estuary. I'd rather play it safe. I, I, you know, I can eat fish from elsewhere. I don't need to risk it. 
Ah, uh, here's a cool question. What are the best resources to read about the history of the Everglades and Lake Okeechobee? In other words, details on how we got into this situation. I, I know I'll vote. I, I love the book, The Swamp. I think it's one of my favorites. I make all of my new employees read it when they start working for Florida Oceanographic Society. Mark and Steve might have some other suggestions as well, probably including our websites. Well, it's the, the history of the Everglades is really, um, a, a great one by Dan, uh, Dave McCalley um, from University of Florida. He, he did a really good uh, survey. The Swamp, of course, by Michael Grunwald is a really good, uh, uh, a good view, particularly on the political side of how, how we got to where we are with this situation. Um, so those are some really good resources. And of course, uh, The Everglades River of Grass by Marjorie Stoneman Douglas gives you that real sense of what the river of grass is all about, the Everglades. So. Good. Good I would just add a, a, a few more. Um, Tom Lodge published a book called The Everglades Handbook, and I believe it's in its fourth or fifth edition now. And, and that's a great uh, resource, really, for all things Everglades, including Lake Okeechobee, the Kissimmee River, all the restoration projects, uh, in addition to the natural history and the geological history of this region. Um, and also, I've just received uh, Amy Green's new book, Moving Water. Um, that that uh, I suspect will take more of a, a political perspective on the issue, but um, that, that's something that if you're interested in, in the Everglades, uh, in water quality, uh, Everglades restoration, I think that's one you might wanna check out as well. And that, one, that one's hot off the press. That's a brand new one, certainly worth reading. All right, so are yes. there efforts to develop septic systems that will work properly in Florida's unique you know, geology for areas where it's impossible to get public wastewater lines installed? I think what you said earlier in your talk, uh, Zach, was that septic systems really don't work well in certain soils, and particularly down in the Florida Keys, for instance, where you have coral rock or limestone. Uh, it's not a percolating soil. But septic tanks do work in uh, low density areas that are sandy soils or could percolate down. And the, the septage is, is digested, as you mentioned, by the, the uh, bacteria in the septic tank. So what, what overflows is high in nutrients, but it, it does spread through the drain fields and then percolates out. So if you're close to a water body and in high concentrations, like on a canal, of one right after the other septic tanks, they're not really good systems and they need to be connected and to a central uh, wastewater system, which has done, been done in a lot of areas. Uh, along the St. Lucie Estuary, there are a couple areas which were high density on these canals. Uh, they've connected those to central systems. Um, but if they're out in well percolated soils, low density, one unit per five or 20 acres, they may work fairly well uh, just for a small family situation. But as you mentioned, wastewater is a big issue and the overflowage of wastewater can be a major issue if it's a, a disrupted uh, wastewater plant like near the Indian River Lagoon. And, and I'll, I'll add a little bit, the question was a little bit longer than what I read, but it's a technology type question. And I will add that they are working on um, small tr single family treatment devices that, that treat water better than an old fashioned septic tank. They use aerobic and anaerobic bacteria to break down waste much more effectively. And I think that's probably what the question was addressing, looking at maybe like next generation single site treatment. And it, it is on the horizon, it just hasn't been widely adopted yet. I think there's a cost associated with it. There's a certain amount of maintenance involved. If your home has one of these more advanced uh, wastewater treatment systems, you have to maintain it. But in an area where you can't get public sewer and you have groundwater just a few feet under your feet, it is, it is a, a really good option. So we have a question about the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir. Uh, this guest heard that it's going to be 23 feet deep and they're wondering how on earth that simulates a shallow sheet flow of the river of grass and you know, we talked about aquatic vegetation cleaning water. How does a 23 foot deep storage vessel handle that issue? Good question. Steve, you want to talk about that? Or? Sure. Uh, well, I'll, I'll certainly um, kick it off. So really what we lack with the Everglades, the way it is sort of structured and managed today is we lack storage 
south of Lake Okeechobee. And, and what that storage does is it allows for a place to put water when it's in abundance, when it would otherwise be dumped to the east and the west coast, we know causing harm there. Uh, and also allowing for a large vessel full of water to be able to hold that and ultimately clean it and flow it south to the Everglades when it's needed most. So conceptually, that's how it works. If you get into the details, the way they ensure that you get back to that sheet flow, um, it requires a few things. One, it, it involves filling in uh, some of the canals that currently channelize water through the central Everglades. We want that water to get out into the marsh to flow south along the topography as a sheet. Uh, so backfilling a, a substantial length of the Miami Canal is involved and also creating a spreader-like feature uh, so that when water is taken out of that reservoir, when it passes through those filter marshes, it then overspills the bank of a canal, almost like a sheet, and then it fans out as it moves downstream, uh, mimicking that historic river of grass flow. So it, it entails other features rather than just sort of allowing that massive reservoir to send that high volume of water to the south. It, it involves treatment, it involves spreading out that water and ensuring that it gets downstream the way it did historically. Yeah, ideal. I'll just add to that, um, and, and those are why we do storage and treatment south is really important. Uh, deep water storage obviously is not as desirable. Uh, years back at the, uh, the Everglades Agricultural Area's uh, storage reservoir was supposed to be 60,000 acres, six feet deep. Uh, so it was a shallower system, but we were restricted to a smaller and smaller footprint over the years to 30,000 acres and then eventually even less than that. So, so now we're kind of restricted by the, as the laws went through, uh, the EAA did not want to give up any more land uh, to be developed. So they required that using state lands and that required that footprint be very, very small and therefore have to be pretty deep in order to store that amount of water to go south. So un unfortunately, uh, we don't have that broad flowway system that we'd like to have and mimicking, a, again, a, a valued marsh uh, system like a stormwater treatment area, which is that man-made uh, marsh system to mimic the uh, natural um, Everglades system to take up the nutrients as it flows south. But, but the deep storage reservoir that the, the viewer asked about will have yeah. a shallow stormwater treatment wetland yes. attached yeah. to it. So that's where yeah, you get exactly. the filtration. Right. So we only have right. about five minutes left for questions. I'm going to try to zip through some of these. I apologize if I don't get to your question. We have lots and lots of great questions, but this is an important one. Is there any good reason why federal, state, and local governments should not regu regulate agricultural lands and discharges of pollution and nutrients the same way that governments have regulated commercial and residential real estate development for years? Well, the, the quick answer is no, there is no good reason why the federal government and state and local governments don't regulate agricultural lands on discharging pollution. We don't know why. There are laws on the books. They should be regulated uh, just as commercial development. Any Anytime we go to an area and develop an area, we're required to retain and detain the water on our site before it flows off the site in order that it's treated and it doesn't flow off quickly. And so that's not required of the agricultural um, interests in land. So they're not so regulated and they, they're allowed to apply certain fertilizers and things that are over nitrifying or over neutrifying these, uh, the waters that run off of those lands. So um, it is unfortunate that we need to regulate them as the same way we do um, other kind of developments or anything that, that allows water to run off your property into, um, into waters of the state. So I think it's a good question why they don't, but there's no good reason, unfortunately, why they don't, other than the political will to do it. And, and that leads us nicely to the next question. Uh, powerful agricultural interests, both north and south of Lake Okeechobee, have long been an in, impediment to meaningful change to water management policies. Is there a compromise scenario 
that's viable for interests both environmental and agricultural. Well, taking a stab at that, yes, yes, there is a viable scenario. We can have agriculture and ag as and also have the environment and restore the environmental health. Um, if you take certain areas of the agricultural and return them back to those marshes and those wetlands that we need and, and restore those Everglades functions, you can still have agriculture as long as it's clean agriculture and they store and treat the water on, on their sites and, and retain that um, you know, fertilizer and recycle that within their own systems uh, rather than allowing it to run off into um, the environment and into the Everglades. So is there a way north and south of the lake to do that? Absolutely. We can, it's not a compromise in a way. It's, it's saying, hey, we can have both good clean agricultural use and other activities as well as restoring our habitats in the environment if we can work together. We just have to compromise in a way to, to give up a little bit of the land uh, for restoring that. And on the other end, it's not totally wiping out that activity or that business. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, we still have well over 100 people listening in. I think, I think I'm gonna try to go, uh, go over eight by just a couple of minutes. I think, if, I think I have maybe two or three more quick questions that I would like you guys to answer. It might put us at 8.05 instead of eight o'clock sharp, but with, with this many people still tuned in, I think it's worth trying to answer a couple of these better questions. Uh, at the national level, water keeper organizations tend to be third party organizations that will sue polluters that violate the Clean Water Act. Do you know whether there are any active water keeper organizations here in Florida, and if they've been successful in any efforts to hold polluters accountable? I think that's a great question. Mark, do you want to start in on well, that? Well, I think, yeah, there are water keeper organizations here in Florida, and right here on the East Coast, uh, we have the, you know, the Lake Worth Lagoon water keeper, the Indian River Lagoon water keeper. Um, they're very much a presence, and they're very big advocates, and they join in the national level and they have the national water keepers and organizations join them in actually bringing, uh, you know, legis uh, legality against those polluters and suits, uh, lawsuits against that. Um, they've been very active in our, in our Florida area um, and joining other organizations who also are able to bring uh, lawsuits against those who are polluting. So they are active. I just would recommend you, uh, you find out about who they are and what they're doing. Talk to their directors. Uh, we have some very active Indian River Lagoon and, and Lake Worth Lagoon in our area. Yeah, and I'll just add that um, also down here, I live in Miami. Um, this past year, we experienced a fish kill in Biscayne Bay and the Biscayne water keeper played an important role in uh, communicating and, and also advocating for action on that issue. The Calusa Waterkeeper on the West Coast is another example, um, you know, analogous in terms of dealing with discharges and pollution from Lake Okeechobee. So these are active groups around South Florida. That's great. Mark, you mentioned LOSOM, the Lake Okeechobee Systems Operating Manual. Uh, this viewer was wondering which new alternative in the LOSOM plan is the leading candidate and which one should all of us be supporting the most to try to improve the health of the Everglades, the St. Lucie, the Indian River Lagoon, and the Caloosahatchee? Well, that's a good question. They, uh, they're, during this process, looking at thousands and thousands of model runs or iterations of how they could manage the lake by the discharges or releases they do to the east or to the west, or to the south and what's good for the lake, what's good for south ecology, also what's good for St. Lucie ecology or the Caloosahatchee. And one of the runs that they came up with um, was particularly 4C13307-22448. Now I don't expect you to remember that exactly, but that's a particular alternative that does show zero discharges to the St. Lucie estuary while still discharging some water to the Caloosahatchee and of course south of the lake. Um, so what they've done there is demonstrate, the Corps has demonstrated that there are scenarios and there are model runs that can do that, that can have zero discharges to the St. Lucie estuary in River Lagoon, for instance, that never was connected to the lake. On the west coast, of course, they, they, they've overdrained the Caloosahatchee, so those estuary 
that does you know require some water, particularly in the dry season. And unfortunately now it has to come from the lake before they restore that watershed. So there are these scenarios that they've run in Losum. Uh, of course, we're looking to advocate the one that has zero discharges to the St. Lucie and allow the estuary to recover on its own. So good question. And Zach, I'll, I'll just add to that. So the, the Losum is really just a set of rules and how to manage water uh, in Lake Okeechobee. And it, it's not unlike the rules of the road where, you know, speed limit in one zone might be 35 miles per hour. It might be 65 in another, but the infrastructure itself um, may not be any different. So in this case, we've got the infrastructure to where we can send more water south to the Everglades when we know we have water in that lake. And I kind of spoke to that with the inequities of water management where zero water is going to the Everglades when we know we have water in Lake Okeechobee. So the, the infrastructure allows for more flexibility in the rules at which we use to operate that. So what we would like to see is uh, rules to allow more water to go south, which we know would position the lake in such a way that would help to minimize or maybe even avoid discharges as we saw a couple years ago. Uh, so it, it, there is some flexibility, but we also know that we need more infrastructure, uh, the storage, especially south of Lake Okeechobee, that can help us send even more water uh, to the south. And again, cutting those discharges as much as possible. All right. Uh, do we currently have sufficient federal funding to fully restore the Everglades? If not, how much money is needed to complete ongoing projects with the goal of having a restored Everglades? Well, I'll take a stab at that. So we've been at this for 20 years now, comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. Um, thus far, the, the federal government has underfunded uh, Everglades restoration in SERP relative to the state. Uh, the, the difference is about 5 billion from the state and roughly 2 billion from the federal government. The projects that Congress has authorized, uh, if you look at the Army Corps of Engineers schedule over the next nine years, taking us to 2030, it calls for another seven billion to complete that job. So what we need to see is stepped up funding from the federal government to the tune of about five billion relative to what that would leave in the balance for the state of about two billion to finish the job. And I think I'm going to wrap up with, with a unique question. It's a little bit of an open-ended question. I think all three of us should take a stab at it with just a, a couple of sentences each. This guest is wondering, how, how do you best tell a compelling story of the Everglades to those who are perhaps slightly more difficult to engage with and to inspire? You know, for me, it's as simple as, you know, there's nowhere else on earth like the Florida Everglades. We were able to engineer its demise using, ten, you know, century-old techniques we have modern technology to fix some of those problems. We, you know, all hope has not been lost yet, but we just need support. And, and ultimately it's a combination of scientific support and political support, but heavily weighted towards political support. So keep educating yourself and, and talk to people as much as you can and, and get them to understand the value of having elected officials who care about the health of Florida's waters. I don't know if any, any of you guys wanna add anything to that. I think you hit it on the head, Zach. Uh, you know, water connects us all here in Florida. And I don't know wherever you live or whatever you're doing, it's trying, it's hard to kind of inspire somebody or engage somebody in this kind of what seemingly is a very complex issue. But we don't need to make it complex. It's about water. It's about putting water and having water in the right places for the right times in, in order for these environments to thrive that we all enjoy and, and work with. So having that water in the right place and water connects us all. We need water to drink. We need water for our livelihoods. We need water to for all the other life here on earth. So in Florida, we're all connected. And I don't care what you do or how you're doing it, find a connection and find somebody and some way to make that connection uh, with other people who may not otherwise think about it or otherwise think, oh, well, it doesn't affect me, so therefore I don't have to. Yes, it, it affects us. It affects us all. 
I, I would just say, rather than reiterating what you have said, I, I agree 100% with that, is that we can do this. We, we have great confidence that Everglades restoration works and will deliver the benefits, not just to our environment, but also to our economy. Uh, for those reasons that, that both Mark and Zach mentioned. All right, well, I apologize if I didn't get to any of your questions tonight. We had a, a tremendous response to the Q&A session and we, we let it run a little bit long, but I think it was worthwhile. I do wanna make just a, a couple of quick announcements. Please visit both of our websites, floridaocean.org and evergladesfoundation.org. There are a lot of Everglades and water quality related resources that you can pick up from both websites. And finally, uh, this presentation has been recorded and it will be shared through Florida Oceanographic Society's website. I would imagine Everglades Foundation will have a way of sharing it as well. So if you enjoyed it and you thought you would like to share it with somebody in your life who might also enjoy it, please, uh, once we have it posted, share away. We'd love to have more people view. We had a great turnout tonight, but you know, this is one of those things that can be reused over and over again to try to inspire and educate people. All right, thank you again to both Mark and Steve. Thank you to our amazing audience tonight. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Take care.